In this video, I'm going to show you how to merge three files into one main worksheet. First, I will show you how to merge all the columns. Then I'll show you how to merge individual columns. And finally, I'll show you how to return the overall totals from the files. Now, if you like this video, then please click on the like button. And if you'd like to get notified of my upcoming videos, then click on the subscribe button and the bell icon beside it. And don't forget, you can download the full source code for this video in the description below. And you can use the source code in any application that you want to create for yourself. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first task we're doing is the most straightforward one. We've got our master sheet here in our current workbook. And what we want to do is read the data from three separate files and place it all here. Now we've got our three files in this folder and we'll just open one and take a look. So you can see what we have is very simple. We've got the date, we've got the name of a product and we've got the number of sales for that product. So what we want to do is we want to take these three fields and we want to put all the data into our main workbook. But we also want to put in the country and we get the country from the file name. Now we know what we're doing, let's go ahead and write the code. Now we're going to write the code to create our first report. You can see I've put in some basic error handling already and we'll be using that a bit later. So the first thing we want to do is get the folder from the user. Once we've got the folder, we want to read through the files in the folder. And then for each file, we want to read the data from that particular file and we'll read that to an array and then we'll write out that array to our main worksheet, which is the worksheet in our current file. So let's start with getting the folder. We create a variable here, which is simply a string variable, and we're going to use a function, and this will be get folder. And now because this is the type of function that we could use in many places, we're going to put it in its own module, and we're going to call this module modutils. So this is our function, public function, get folder, and this will return a string. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the Windows dialog box to choose the folder. And it's very easy to do this. We basically use application and we use file dialog. And then we just specify there's four types. We're going to specify a folder picker because we want to pick the folder. So now what we do is we set the title and the title is what appears in the title of the dialog when it appears. And then once that's done, we use show. So show brings up the dialog and the code will stop here until the user selects something or clicks cancel. Now, once they've selected something or once they've clicked OK or cancel, what we do is we check if there was an item selected. And if there wasn't an item selected, we want to end the application. We don't want to go any further. So we just raise an error. And what it means is that this error will be caught in our main procedure and displayed to the user. So we just put in get folder as our location. And then what we put in is just the message that we want to say, send back. And this could be anything, something like no folder was selected, file processing has been cancelled. So if there is no error, we just continue on and we return what's in the first selected item collection. So what's at position one of the selected items? And that's our folder. So this is how we get the user to select the folder. Now we want to put a backslash at the end, but instead of putting a backslash in the code, we use application dot path separator. BBA will convert this to the appropriate symbol depending on the platform or on the locale settings. So now let's test that our get folder is working correctly. And we do this by doing a debug print and we're going to print the folder that we get back to the immediate window. So let's run our code. We're going to select the folder. You see the dialog came up here. We selected sales our folder, we clicked OK and you can see that the name of the folder was written to the immediate window. Now we run the code again and this time we click cancel and you can see it says no folder was selected, file processing cancel. So this is really good because it means that our code is working and we're going to be using this get folder in different reports in our application. Now one more useful thing we can do, and you may not have seen something like this before, is we can use some compilation directives like this. So what we can do is we can say if debugging is turned on, then let's just return the folder. And why we do this is Every time we're running the code and testing it, we don't always want to be bringing up the dialogue and having to select sales. So we can just hard code it into our code, but we do it in our debugging section. And what this means then is that when we turn debugging off, it won't be seen by the user. So we step through the code, you can see it skips over this whole part because debugging isn't set to one. So if we want to set debugging to one, we go to tools, the project properties, and we go to conditional compilation arguments. And we just set debugging equals one. That's all we've got to do. And then we click OK. And now when we step through the code, what you'll see is that it actually goes in here and reaches this code. 
This is very useful to use in our code when we're debugging and testing as it saves us a lot of time. Now we have the folder, we're going to read through all the files in that folder using the dir function. So we use file name as a variable to store the current file name and we'll be using data a bit later. This is what we're going to be using to store our data. So file name equals dir and what we supply to dir is the folder and we also want to do a filter. So we want to say all the files that start with sales and are basically Excel files. And this will return us all of these. Now, it'll return us the first one the first time we do it. So we check the length of the file name is greater than zero. And then at the end of our loop, what we will do is we will do dir again. So we do dir again without any parameters and it gives us the next file in the sequence. So each time we get a new file name and when there's none left, we'll just exit the loop. Now, the first thing we want to do with each file is we want to call read data and read the data and that will go into the variant that we declared which is which will be an array and we're supplying this with the folder and the file name to read so let's create our read sub down here now data is the array that we're going to be passing back we're going to be filling this up with the data and we're going to be returning it from our read data through this parameter now the first thing we do is we open the workbook and we're going to store the workbook in the book variable we use workbooks open and we essentially use the file name and we use the read-only parameter, which we set to true. And the reason is, is that if someone has it open already, then it doesn't affect our code. Now, once we have the book open, what we want to do is we want to get the range. So we set range equal the book, and we're going to use worksheets, and we're going to say it's the first worksheet. Now, if you're dealing with different workbooks, it could be, there could be multiple worksheets, so you might want to pick a name. It all depends on the requirements. Now, we get the current region, which will give us back the entire range, and then what we do is we say let data equal range and we do offset one this moves it off the header and then we resize it by one because we don't have the header anymore so this is basically just removing the header and then of that range we're basically going to pass that range to data and what this does is it automatically creates a two-dimensional array and places it in data so now we have all the data what we want to do is we want to close our book and we set save changes equals false. We don't want to be asked to save changes and we don't want to save anything anyway. So now let's test if this code actually works. And we do this by putting a breakpoint on the line after call read data. And then what we're going to do is we're going to check the contents of our array. So we run the code and you can see it stopped here. So let's add data to the watch window. And now you can see there's a plus beside it. And this is always with things like an array or an object, and we open each one, and you can see that all the data is there as we expected. Now, if we wanted, we can go to the file, and we would check against the data just to make sure that it was exactly correct. And so you can see that the code we've written so far, it's working correctly, it's reading the data, and the next thing that we want to do with the code is to write out the data. We'll create a sub to write out the data, and we'll pass it the array that we just got from read data. What we'll also pass it is the country name. So we get the country name from the actual file name. So we need to write a function to do this. Now this is very common in real world applications where you might actually have to parse the name of the file name to get some information. So in this case, we're figuring out the country from the file name. So we're going to use the split function to help us parse the name. So if you're not familiar with the split function, it's a very useful way of parsing variable size strings and what it does is it splits the string by a delimiter so we're splitting it first of all by a space and what this will do is this will leave us the last part of the string and the last part of the string will just remove the part with the full stop so we'll we'll, we'll split that again and we'll take the first part so array u bound this basically gives us the last part of the first array and we're going to split this by the full stop and then we use zero to give us the first part of the array that was returned from the split. Now we use a simple test sub, and this test sub allows us to easily test to see if it worked correctly. So now we'll try it with Australia. And when we run it, you'll see that it worked correctly. So this is an easy way to test any new functions that we create without having to run our entire application to test them. Now we're going to switch to the report all columns module, and we're going to create our write data sub. So the write data sub takes the array as a parameter and the country as parameter. 
And using these items, we'll write the data out to the worksheet. So the worksheet we're going to use is the one all column and SH all is the code name. So it allows us to access it directly. Now what we need first is the new row and the new row is the first free row in our worksheet. And we get that by basically going to the end of the records. Now how we do it is we go to the very last cell. So rows count brings us down to the very last cell and this is in column one and we basically use end Excel up to bring us up. So it's like using control up arrow. And that brings us to the last cell with data in column one. And we add one to this because we want to start on the cell after this. So now that we've got the starting position, the first thing we're going to do is write out column one, which has the country. So all the cells in column one will have the country. And we basically use a range by getting the start cell and the end cell. So the start cell is the new row and it's in column one. And the end cell is also in column one and it's new row plus the number of items in the array. Now we take one away from this because we're already starting on row one of the range. So we simply assign this range then to country. Now what we want to do is write out the rest of the data that we actually read from the worksheet. So we start with the position, which is new rows, column two, and we basically assign it to the data. So that's pretty straightforward. But one thing we must do is we must resize our range. And it's very easy to resize because it's simply the size of the array. So we say U bound data one, and that gives us the number of rows or the, the first dimension, and U bound data two gives us the number of columns or the second dimension. And that's our right data done. So let's test our code and see that it worked correctly. We'll run the code from create report all columns. You can see all the files opening and, and flickering on and off. And let's look at the results in our all column worksheet. You can see this printed out Australia, then UK, then US, and all the results from those. And of course, we should test these to make sure that we've got the right data. Now often when we're copying data, we don't want to copy all the columns, we want to copy individual columns. We're going to change our existing code and we're going to alter it so that it reads individual columns. So in our case, we're going to read column one and three. The only real change we have to make is in read data. First of all, we resize our array to the size we want, and that's going to be to the range of data, the number of rows minus one. And that's because we're taking off the header. And it's going to be two columns because we're taking columns one and three. So now what we do is we're going to resize our range to remove the header, and then we're going to place the results of that in our temporary array. So we use offset one, so this moves our range down one, so off the header, and then we resize it to the current size minus one row. And then we have basically all the data except the header. And we're placing this all in a temporary array, which is current data. So what we do then is we read through our array. So we read through the current array, and this goes from L bound, which is the first item in the array, to U bound, which is the last item in the array. And then what we want to do is we basically just want to assign each individual field. So the current item, which is I, the current row, and we're saying column one equals what's in current data one. And we're saying the second column will be what's in current data three. So this is the amount. And so this is how we do it. Now we, we delete that extra one because we didn't need it. And that's the change we make to read the individual columns. Now we're going to write it out to a different worksheet. So I'm just going to make one little change to the right data. And we're going to run the code now and see what happens. See all the files being read. And if we look again, you can see that it's read just the date and the amount, and it has ignored the product column. So it's just written the two columns that we were expecting. And so this is the extra code we've written when we want to read individual columns rather than all the data. Our task this time is to get the total sales for each product. And we'll write out the results so they look like this. We have product on one side and we have amount on the other. So this is an example of what a result will look like. So let's go ahead and write the code. Now we're going to use a dictionary instead of an array because this is a much easier way to sum data. So if you want to know more about the dictionary, then check out my dictionary playlists. Now we must do tools reference and Microsoft scripting runtime. And we do this because the dictionary is in an external library. Now, once we do this, we have access to the dictionary. 
So we're going to declare this as a dictionary. We're actually going to say new dictionary here because this is the point that we want to create our new dictionary. Now the next change is that we're going to do write data and we're going to put write data outside our loop because we're going to read through all the files, store all the data in our dictionary and sum it as we go. And then finally, we'll write out the final dictionary data in one go to the worksheet. So the first change we make here in read data is that we change the dictionary because as I said, we're no longer using an array. So we're passing in the dictionary. But what we're also going to do is we're going to return the dictionary as well. And the reason that we can do this is that when we return something in VBA, that's an object, we're simply passing the address around. Whereas when it's an array, VBA will copy all the contents of the array and that can be quite inefficient. So we're going to pass back the dictionary when we're finished with it here because it makes it more obvious in the code that we're doing something with the dictionary when we can see it's been passed back from a function. Now we declare two variables here and the reason we use these is simply to make the code more readable. So rather than having lots of parentheses and i's and twos around, we just have the name of the variable. Now product is going to be in the first column or it's going to be in the second column and amount is going to be in the third column. We're going to use product as the dictionary key and we're going to assign this to what's currently stored at that value plus the current amount. Now if the item doesn't already exist in the dictionary then VBA will automatically add it to the dictionary for us. If you don't know how the dictionary works then make sure to check out my dictionary playlist. So now we'll return the data using set read data equals data and this will return the dictionary to our calling sub. So now we'll put a breakpoint on the last line in this procedure and we'll stop the code here and then we'll check what's in our dictionary. So we add data to the watch window by right clicking and selecting add watch and clicking OK. And if you click on the plus you can see a list of all the keys and all these keys of course have values. So to get a value we'll just drag data in again. I'm just going to put the name of one of the keys in parentheses and that will be tablet. And you can see it gives back the value for tablet which is 2721. And of course if we're doing a real world application what we would do here is check the values and make sure that they were what we were expecting. So now we're going to make changes to the right data procedure. We're going to change data itself to a dictionary because it's not an array in this case and we don't need country because we're getting the overall totals for each product and country doesn't come into it. Now we change the sheet name to sheet total because we're writing out to a different sheet. Now new row will stay as the same because we still want to find out the next blank row just in case we've been writing values there the last time and we're going to change our cells here so this is going to be slightly different. So what we write out here is data and we write out the items. So these are all the items that are stored at different values. This is an actual array itself. But our resize is going to be a bit different. We're just going to have one column. So the items are going to be written to one column and it's going to be dictionary count. So the number of items that are in the dictionary and that's our resize. Now there's one other change we have to make and that is the way we write out an array typically is written across. So what we have to do is transpose the data. So in other words, we're converting the data from a row of data in two columns. Now you can see I split it over two lines and that's just to make it appear clearer on the screen. Now we write out keys in exactly the same way. So instead of data items, this time we're using data keys. The only difference is that we're writing keys to column one and we're writing the items to column two and the items being the totals. So let's get rid of get country from file name. We wanna get rid of this from the call to write data because we don't need the country. When we run the application, what you'll see is that we get the results on our screen here. So you can see for each of the products, we've got the total. Now again, if you're doing a real world application, we go and compare this and make sure that the values are correct. If you found this video useful, you may want to check out my ultimate guide to copying data. Now, If you liked the video, please click on the like button. And if you'd like to get notified of my upcoming videos, then click on the subscribe button and the bell icon beside it. See you on the next video.